Now Uru, the country that ate itself. Let's talk about a small island lost in the middle of the Pacific. An island with a tragic destiny. This Pacific island had one of the highest standards of living in the world, before it collapsed. This is the story of Nauru, the country that ate itself. This territory, smaller than the island of you, contains barely 10,000 inhabitants, located 4,835 kilometers from Australia, and extending over 22 square kilometers. Nauru sits just between Australia and Hawaii. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new videos. It was not until November 8, 1798, when a British ship called the Snow Hunter, passed by the island on its way to the China Seas, that a European saw the island for the first time. As the British ship sailed past the island of Nauru, hundreds of Nauruans came out in canoes to greet the sailors. The captain of the ship was called John Fern, and he did not allow his men to disembark from the ship. No Nauruan dared to board the boat either. However, the welcome and kindness of the Nauruans charmed Captain Fern. Fern enjoyed the island's green central plateau, beautiful palm trees and white sandy beaches. He liked the island so much that he named it Pleasant Island. At that time, life on the small island was mostly peaceful. For thousands of years, Nauruans had managed to live largely with nature, on this remote but self-sufficient island. But why is Nauru now nicknamed the country that ate itself? To better understand, let's explore the history of Nauru. The majority of Nauru's population is concentrated on a coastal strip surrounding a central plateau. It is on this plateau that massive deposits of phosphate have been discovered, used in particular for the creation of fertilizers and explosives. One day, while sailing to Nauru in 1901, geologist Albert Ellis discovered that 80% of the entire island of Nauru was rich in phosphate. In 1905, an agreement was made with Germany to mine Nauru. German settlers were pleased to discover that Nauru had developed a huge phosphate deposit. This exploitation began in 1906, for the benefit of German settlers. Over the next decade, Nauru began exporting hundreds of thousands of tons of phosphate. The German settlers grew rich, thanks to this discovery until 1914, when it was Australia's turn to profit from this exploitation. Nauruans have never built homes on the island's high central plateau, which is rich in phosphate. However, this part of the island was home to wild almond trees and planted pandanus trees, as well as flocks of birds including brown noddies and terns. German miners cleared the brush, ferns and trees on this part of the island, scraped up the topsoil, then extracted the ore from pits and crevices in the underlying ancient coral. Australia took advantage of this exploitation in 1914, and took control of the island until 1968. By then Australia ruled over Nauru, having wrested it from Germany at the start of World War I. Australia declared the island a mining site, and began to focus on building mining infrastructure, mechanizing mining and exporting phosphates. By the early 1920s, Nauru was already exporting around 200,000 tons of phosphate a year. Two decades later, the amount was more than four times that amount, all at a price below the global average to subsidize farmers in Australia, New Zealand, and Britain. Over the next two decades, exports steadily increased, with farmers in Australia and New Zealand continuing to pay far below market prices until 1963. It was in 1968 that Nauru finally obtained its independence, becoming the smallest republic in the world. By the time Nauru gained independence, more than 35 million metric tons of phosphate had left its coastline. Yet Nauru's share of its phosphate mining was actually minimal when you consider the benefits, destruction and cost of restoring the mined lands. After the independence of the Republic of Nauru, 
the island chose to exploit its remaining phosphate, increasing its exports knowing that the reserves would be exhausted within a generation or two. During this time, the small country acquired an airline, multiplied the social benefits for its inhabitants, and invested heavily abroad. On paper, at least, the Nauruans got richer over the next two decades, but, most Nauruans certainly did not live in luxury. The Nauru government, on the other hand, did not tax income, provided free education and health care, and was the main employer of immigrants who usually worked in the mines. The government also purchased cruise ships, planes and hotels overseas. Interestingly, at this time sports cars became highly prized possessions in Nauru, even though it takes 20 minutes to drive around the island. A police chief once even imported a Lamborghini, only to find later that it was too tight on the wheel. This sort of thing often happened, when Nauruans made mistakes buying things they didn't necessarily need. In 1974, Nauru had the second largest GDP per capita in the world, three times higher than that of the United States. The country generated around $225 million in the same year. It had become the second richest country in the world. It was the beginning of a new exceptional economic prosperity for this small island. Nauru continued to grow rich over the years by continuing to export its phosphate. It benefited from all its junk food, American cars and more. With the great wealth of Nauru, its citizens and government officials were flaunting it. The great wealth of this small island in the Pacific, earned it the nickname, Kuwait of the Pacific. All its inhabitants were rentiers and were attracted by its consumer society. Despite all this, Nauru sought compensation from New Zealand, Australia and Britain for mining damage before July 1967. However, even after independence, Australia did not want to consider compensating Nauru. After decades of delay, in 1989 Nauru sued Australia at the International Court of Justice. As Nauru had a strong case, Australia agreed to pay 57 million Australian dollars in 1994 and a further 50 million Australian dollars over the following 20 years. Subsequently, the United Kingdom and New Zealand each contributed 12 million Australian dollars to reduce Australia's burden. This settlement was a moral and legal victory for Nauru. Now we want to understand why Nauru is a country that ate itself. In the early 1990s, the source of its phosphate dried up. This brought about the total ruin of Nauru and led the people of the country to fall into the most terrible of miseries. 80% of Nauru's land was devastated, and 40% of marine life was killed. As the economic crisis of this small island worsened, the health crisis of the population also increased. Obesity increased, life expectancy fell below 60 years, and mining completely disfigured the landscape. According to the 2020 reports, Nauru has the highest rate of obesity in the world, affecting 61% of adults, the second highest rate of smoking, 47% of adults, and the highest rate of diabetes of type 2, 40% of the population. In 1870, Nauruans were already smoking and drinking heavily, including sour toddy, a drink made by fermenting coconut blossoms. But the rate of smoking and alcohol consumption increased further after Nauru's economic crisis. Nauru used to invest heavily overseas, but when the phosphate deposits dried up in the early 1990s, the country's economy began to collapse. Real estate investments by the government of Nauru proved unsuccessful. The country could not rely on any other resources, such as tourism, because it was badly damaged by mining. As seizures multiply, the industry collapsed, and governments changed. The Republic of Nauru adopted different strategies to fill its coffers and resolve its economic crisis, such AAs, foreign money laundering, the sale of passports, paid reception of illegal refugees, and others. Unfortunately, over the years, these dishonest activities earned Nauru harsh accusations from the United Nations, the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and Amnesty International. 
These illegal activities brought Nauru tens of billions of dollars in criminal profits which did not even allow it to solve its economic problem. Today, the Republic of Nauru is an island of dry, industrial landscapes, depopulated plants and animals. The inhabitants still live on this small island, but are still threatened by rising waters. Since the early 1900s, Nauru has lost at least 80% of its original vegetation. Despair seems to invade the whole island, with few restaurants and only a few hotels, Nauru is not very touristy. High unemployment and alcoholism are also rampant, contributing to domestic violence and frequent drink-driving offenses. Nauru's paradise side has caused it to lose its nickname Pleasant Island as the phosphate deposits have dried up. A combination of greed, colonial mismanagement and gross incompetence has brought Nauru to the brink of collapse. The inhabitants of the country had time to take full advantage of its wealth before it was drowned underwater, unfortunately. Here is a dark story of the smallest island nation in the world, the island of Nauru, once very prosperous, thanks to its land filled with phosphate, but which ended up becoming more and more impoverished after having exhausted almost all its reserves. What's next for Nauru? Only time will tell. Today, Nauru is still trying to find a place for itself in the global economy. Since 2006, it has modernized its mining equipment, and refurbished its mining infrastructure, to extract the harder to reach phosphate. But its phosphate industry produces nothing comparable to the past. Currently, Nauru does not have a long-term solution to its economic problems. Climate change is destroying this island, droughts and storms are intensifying, and rising waters are eroding its coastline. James A. Jaimia, pastor of the Congregational Church of Nauru, who died in 1999 at the age of 88, dreamed of going back in time in the last years of his life. In 1995, during an interview with a journalist from the New York Times, an American daily newspaper, Enjaimia lamented, saying, I wish that this phosphate had never been discovered. I would like Nauru to be like before. When I was little, it was so beautiful, there were trees, it was green everywhere, and you could eat coconuts and fresh breadfruit. Now I see what happened here, and I want to cry. Unfortunately, Enjaimia's wish never came true. Thanks for watching until the end. See you soon in our new video.